teaser to what we're going to be opening our service up tonight with. We're going to be talking a little bit about Peru and the things that God did while we were down there, not just for what, how he used us, but how he grew us and the things that he's done. So we're going to begin sharing with the church a little bit of those things. And then tonight, Brother Ron Lancaster is going to bring the message. God's been dealing with him, and so we're going to turn him loose. That sounds like a plan. I'm excited about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about Peru and then a lot about Jesus. And so make sure if you ain't got plans, if you do have plans, change them. Be here at 6 tonight. It's going to be a great service, great opportunity to see how God's working. So today we're going to start a new series. And it's not necessarily a series. We're going to be working all the way through 1 John. We're going to be starting in chapter 1 today. And we're going to look at it from an expository perspective. And so I'm really excited about it. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I think that's probably why this will be the first one that we'll do on Sunday morning as the entire uh, book, but there's, there's a lot of themes within 1 John, but one thing that sticks out to me every time I read it is four different occasions within the entire book, he says these things, these things, and so when you think about these things, they're really important marks within this book. One time, one time he says these things we write, another time he says these things I write, and twice he writes these things I have written. And all of these things are super important because we're going to find our themes within the text. And so what's the theme? You know, most everybody that's been through the, the book of 1 John is going to read it and they're going to respond with the theme is love. And it absolutely is. There is a theme of love throughout it. It's from cover to cover. John writes of love over and over and over. And so in this, though, I find something that really sticks out to me more than anything else that love is expressed in a manner that we can have what I have labeled and what I've heard before is called a no-so salvation. A no-so salvation. And so that, that is the love. The love that God has for us that John expresses through, the, through this book, 1 John, is so that we can know that we have salvation. We can know who we are. We can know whom we belong to. And we can know where you're going to spend eternal life. It's all about you having the assurance of who you are in him. And so if you've got your, your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to work in verses 1 through 4 today. And we're going to start identifying these themes, this, these things, these themes. Wow, that's really difficult for me to say at the same time. But we're going to find these themes within these things and, and begin with it here. So if you've got your place, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Stand with me if you don't mind as we honor God in the reading of his word. If you don't have it with you, it'll be on the board back here. But today we're going to be looking at the senses of spirituality. And you're going to find that this passage is absolutely covered in, in our senses. And so 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, look with me. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to you, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you absolutely hide me behind your cross and that you speak. That you speak to everybody in this room and help them understand who you are and who we are in relation to you. Lord, help us to understand our need for you, and I pray today that you move and you touch those hearts that do not have a personal relationship with you, and Lord, that you draw them near and that you save each one. Father, I know you're going to do great things, and so Lord, we're going to give you the room to do it. And we praise you and thank you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so within this text... You, you remember the five senses. We were taught about them in elementary school. And in this text, we really see these things expressed. So what were the five senses? And I'm going to look so that I don't overlook one of them in this moment. But the first is see, to be able to see, to be able to observe. The second is to hear, sound. The next is smell. Sometimes we don't necessarily want that one so much. Then the next one's taste. And the last is touch. And in this text, we're going to see most of these senses are expressed and so I want to kind of talk about the end before we get back into these senses of spirituality though in the end the text culminates with John writing about the full joy he wants us to, to, to be able to experience this full joy and so I want to ask everybody in this place 
Because this is really important. What brings you full joy? What is it? We, we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school today. I've talked, I mean, my goodness. Uh, we've been talking about joy a lot around here. And so for our grandparents, what brings you joy? Is it, is it those grandbabies? Is it holding them? Is, is it playing with them? Is, is it, man, does that bring you joy? Look, Crystal and I, we, we had our first set of kids when we were younger. And now we've had our second set of kids when we're a little bit older. It's almost like I'm a grandparent. And sometimes I wonder if the behaviors follow that too. I don't know. But, but the thing is, we, 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 it's just an incredible thing. So to, just being a grandparent, holding those grandbabies, does that bring you joy? What about when you can't see them? Just that, that phone call, being able to hear that voice. You know, those are things that bring you joy. But what, what about everybody in this room? What brings you joy? And so in our text today, John writes... And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And so John wants us to know that we can have joy and be full of it. He wants us to know that we can have joy and be full of it. We don't have to be the Debbie Downers that we so often are. We can be filled with joy in all that we do. You know, think about this. We had Miss, Miss Debbie Childers here for our joy group. Remember, joy just older youth. They're full of joy, right? But Miss Debbie Childers was here Monday April Fool's Day, and she, and she it was a comedian. Listen, I'm a cynic when it comes to comedians. I am not a very big fan. And then you add the label Christian comedian in front of it, and then I'm like, oh, double negative right there. But, but she came, and I'm going to tell you what, my joy was full listening to her stories and the things that she shared. But why is that? Because God wants us to have joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that we should be filled with. We should be able to enjoy. And so God wants us to have it, and John's writing to us, so that these things, so that we can be full in these things and joy. And so today as we look into our text, we're going to see these spiritual senses that I was talking about. And, and then the way we want to uh, dive into it is, so what are these things that we can find in the text? And the first thing is out of 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, the, the, the Jesus that was prophesied. The Jesus that was prophesied. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, again, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have, you can underline it in your Bible, heard which we have seen, and you can underline seen with your own eyes, which we have looked upon, you can underline looked upon, and our hands have handled, you can underline handled, concerning the word of life. We need to know that the very Messiah that was prophesied is the very Jesus that John is writing about here. We need to understand the foundation of the book of 1 John is Jesus. It's the prophesied Jesus, and we're going to get deeper into who he is as we work through this, but this prophecy has become reality. The prophecy has become reality, and, 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 and because of that, John could say that he heard, that he saw, that he looked upon, that he handled all of that with our Lord Jesus Christ. He was there. He got to express. He got to feel. He got to touch. He got to see. He got to smell. He got to experience Jesus completely. And so John is speaking of that which is from the beginning. And we know that's Jesus because we understand that, but we need to go a little bit deeper so that we have a foundation to know why we can say that. Like in the Gospel of John, he's pointing us to an eternal Jesus. He continues that theme that Jesus is eternal. And we can go all the way back into Genesis 1-3 and we can see the very foundation that God laid for us that John picks back up on. In, in, in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning, which most of you know this scripture by heart, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so from that very, those three very verses, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was in the beginning. He was present for all this. If you were with me many moons ago now, we, we studied through the, the, the themes within the Old Testament to where we could see Jesus' presence. It's a seamless book where he is from cover to cover. But in it, we can look, and in the first verse, we can find the Trinity. Or excuse me, in the first three verses of Genesis, we can find the Trinity already established. In verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God. God was present. God was there. In the second verse, it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the faces of the deep. And so we see that the Spirit of God was present in verse 2. And then we can move into verse 3, and then it says, then God said. What's another name for Jesus? John uses it over and over, the Word, the Word. He's the spoken Word of God. And so in the beginning, we have God. We have the Spirit of God. And then all the way down to verse 3, three then God said, then we have Jesus. We have Him fully present. And so we see Jesus was in the beginning. 
And John also confirmed this in John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Jesus was and is and will be. Jesus is eternal. Jesus has been from the beginning, and Jesus will be all the way through the end. He will always be. And so, but then John gives us a little bit of a sensory overload. Have y'all ever been in that moment before where there's strobe lights or there's all these things going on and it's just all of a sudden it becomes too much to bear? That's kind of what happens here is he begins to express his experience with Jesus. I absolutely love this. Again, let's look at it. Which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. Listen, we have heard, we have seen, we have looked upon, our hands have handled. All of this is concerning the word of life. It's all about Jesus. Let me tell you something. Jesus is real. Jesus is tangible. Jesus, you can lay your hands upon him and he can lay his hand upon you. And if you've never met that Jesus, boy, are you missing out. It's why I say it's a sensory overload. It's just too much to bear. And that is who our Jesus is. John 1, 14. He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is our Jesus. He left heaven. He left perfection and came so that we could touch, we could see, we could smell, and we could hear Him. That is our Jesus. And so the prophecy has arrived, and he was experienced by the apostles. They got to be in that moment right there with Jesus. And so the, these things, when we start looking through this text, these things, these things show us that Jesus was the one that was prophesied. And so not only do we see the prophecy of Jesus in this, these things also reveal the Jesus that was presented. And so look with me in verse 2. It says, The life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Just as I said, he has left the perfection of heaven. He's now stepped down to the footstools of earth and he is present on this place. But Jesus was not just prophesied. He was presented to each of us. Why? For eternal life. He was here to restore us to a relationship with God. He came for those things. The very same Jesus that was seen, that was heard, that was touched by John in verse 1 is the same Jesus that brought eternal life from the Father to all who would call upon his name. This is, he was for everybody that would call on his name. John again reminds us that he saw Jesus. He's bearing witness of Jesus. And now he's declaring this Jesus as eternal and life-giving. There's a reason that John recorded Jesus' words in John 14, 6. Again, very familiar scripture. All of this is today. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said that. Why? Because he's the Jesus that was prophesied. He's the Jesus that was presented so that we could all come to know him and have eternal life with him. Jesus is like that great guard. That great guard standing at that entrance to the place that we all want to get into, that elite spot that we want to be in. And he's saying, you got to come through me. The only way you're ever going to do it is if you know him. You better know him. If you don't know that guard, you ain't getting in. You better know Jesus. So it is estimated that Jesus had ascended into heaven roughly 60 years prior to John writing this letter. Roughly 60 years. And I want you to think about the words that we've heard in these first two verses right now. Think about how his senses, again, I just talked about this sensory overload. And he's, 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 these vivid details of how he had experienced Jesus. It's almost like he's writing about something he was experiencing in that very moment, not something 60 years ago. Listen, I'm, I'm about to be 42 years old in just a few months. And I'm at the place where I can't remember what happened yesterday. But John's telling us what happened 60 years ago. Do you not think that this Jesus that was presented to him should have a lasting impact on us the same way that it did on John, that he did on John? We, we, we want to go through, and we talked about it even in Sunday school today. We get separated from our salvation. We forget the things that the Lord has done for us, and we become numb. We, become, we, we, we just become standoffish to who he is and what he's done. Boy, we need a freshness today. John had it because he went back to the experiences that he had with Jesus when he touched him, when he felt him, when he heard him, when he was right there with him. And it was so much that it was like it just happened. 
Listen, it sounds as though his memory of Jesus was just as vivid in the moment as it was in the day that he met him. And that should be speaking to you. This Jesus that was presented to the apostles is the same Jesus that many in this place call Lord today. I'm not saying all. I said many are calling Lord today. So what are your memories of him? And how has he worked in your life? Is he vivid? Do you have vivid details? Do you have vivid experiences with him? Is it real? Is it tangible? Can you articulate Jesus' presence in your life just as John has? Have you come to that place where it's that, he is that real to you? And it's very important because these things show us the Jesus that was prophesied. And it also shows us the Jesus that was presented. And so it all comes to the, the third point that I want to talk about today. When we look at these things, it's the Jesus that was proclaimed. Wow, y'all better hold on. I don't know that I've ever been to, through two points that fast. I'm going to find the fourth one before we're over. Y'all just hang on. Oh, they're giggling. Okay. All right. But the Jesus that was proclaimed, 1 John 1, 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is, this is something extra. Where's your fellowship today? We just had Easter last week. And listen, I had a friend share with me about something that happened in his Sunday school class at a whole different church. He asked, he asked his class, what does Easter mean to you when it comes to church? One of the most profound statements I've heard, it's prom for the church. Well, that cuts to the heart right there, does it not? Easter is prom for the church. Listen, we need to get dressed up and have fun. That's good. We're going to have this women's tea in a few weeks, and we're going to, they're, they're going to dress up, and it's going to be fun. It's good to do those things. But Easter is not prom for the church, my friends. Easter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we, we would not have salvation, we would not have a pathway to heaven without that resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to get back to what matters. If people, listen, if somebody within the church that proclaims a relationship with Jesus thinks that, what does this world think? We need to get back to what matters, and it is Jesus and Jesus alone. And so here we are, the fellowship. This fellowship that comes with the proclamation of Jesus as Lord, it is absolutely unparalleled. We have a connection among each other that we could have never had before. And I'm going to tell you, boy, goodness, when I come in here for the first time and had fellowship with this church, what an amazing, what an amazing event that was. To be able to sit down and share with like-minded people and people that love, it's a wonderful thing. And that's a fellowship you don't get outside of this place. When you're outside of the church, you don't get those things. And so listen, though, but we are the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. He is waiting for us. He's calling us. He is, he is desiring our presence with him, and we are his church. And listen, Jesus is saying this. He is saying, Come. Come, come. He is calling his people. The Jesus that has been presented is not one that wants to shy away and run from you. He's not one that's far from you. He's one that's saying, come, come. I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to be personal with you. And Jesus, he's saying it. Listen, there's a marriage supper awaiting those that are in Christ. There is a marriage supper that is waiting. There is a time where we're going to be with him. And boy, we're going to have fellowship like you've never experienced. The greatest fellowship that's ever happened at Angel Grove Baptist Church will never compare to the marriage supper with the Lamb. It will never touch it. And so Jesus has been proclaimed so that we can join him. And this is where we find the importance of this passage. I think it really comes together here. John testified of the evidence of Christ and how he had experienced Jesus. That's really important because that experience with Jesus is what gives us the no-so salvation that is themed throughout this text. It's, it's how we know because we experience Jesus. And if you're absent of those experiences, you're never going to know who you truly belong to. You've got to have it with him. You've got to have those experiences with him. And so John's senses were filled by touch, sound, sight, and even smell. And so have you experienced these senses of spirituality? Have you had those moments? I asked it earlier, but I want to ask it again. Have you truly experienced the senses of spirituality? Have you seen Jesus? Have you? You know, we watched that little video about Peru a while ago, and I've shared this before. You go somewhere, you go to Peru. They claim to be Catholic. Everybody claims Catholicism. And so when you start talking to them about salvation, and you start talking to them about Jesus, 
What you're going to hear in every one of them, almost, I mean, it's almost, you can count it when you walk up. You know they're going to tell you about a miracle that's happened. They're going to express some type of miracle that happened in their life where, where something happened that preserved their life or where something happened in their mother's life and it preserved their life. You're always going to hear about those things. Listen, why is that? They're hanging their hat on something that they believe that Jesus has done for them. They, 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 they're not hanging their hat on that personal relationship with him. Listen, a relationship with Jesus is personal. And so you should be able to see him. I'm not personal with anything that I don't see. I'm not. But I'm personal with my Jesus because I have seen him time and time again. Have you heard Jesus? Have you ever heard him before? Boy, there's a small, still voice. But boy, is it audible. It is audible. I have heard from my Jesus. I still remember sitting in my living room and hearing him call my name. And he was saying, come, come. And I gave my life to him in that day. And since then, I hear from him time and time again. Have you heard Jesus? Oh, I love this one. Have you been touched by Jesus? Have you been touched? And I'm not talking about those great miracles. I'm talking about on those days when, when you're on your highs. Do you feel his touch? On those days when you're in your lows, do you feel his touch? Jesus is personal. And I don't care what anybody's told you about him before. I don't care what we've claimed Christianity to be for years and years and years. Jesus is personal. And when he is present in your life, it's undeniable. It's undeniable. It's not a switch that we turn on and off. It's not something we flip back and forth. Oh, I'm with Jesus today, but I'm not today. We're either with him or we're not. He's either with us or he's not. And so have you come to that place where you've been touched by Jesus? John's given us direct evidence of Jesus as the prophesied Savior, as the presented Savior, and now the proclaimed Savior. He's proclaiming him. And so the, through the senses of spirituality, I'm going to tell you without a doubt, John's case is solid. If we were in a criminal court, it is a very solid case because he's given us very direct evidence of how he's experienced him, and he's witnessing that to us today. But I want to introduce one last piece of evidence before I conclude. And boy, is it important. It's filled with undeniable facts. And it's something that he's done inside of me. It's called DNA evidence. You know, you think about this. You see these cases today, and it's their locked, solid, tight cases but the juries will not convict because they were looking for that one extra thing. They want DNA evidence nowadays in everything. They want DNA evidence. And why is that? Because it's infallible. It's absolutely infallible. And so here's what I want to present to you. My DNA and everybody that has a personal relationship with Jesus, your DNA is covered by Jesus. He's within your DNA. He's within your makeup. He is part of you. He came into my life and listen, he turned me literally upside down. And if you've experienced him, he's done the same thing for you. He's changed me from head to toe because his DNA is in me. There's no way the things that have happened inside of me could have ever happened without Jesus. And if you've experienced him, you would say the same exact thing. If you need proof, we always are still looking for more proof. If you need proof, I want you to go and you ask that one right there. You ask my wife, has Jesus changed me? Is it evident that he's part of my DNA? And listen, I'm not telling you this because this is all about me. This should be the story that every one of us have when Jesus became part of our lives. And if you don't believe me, ask my children. Have I been changed? Crystal sent me a picture. or She pulled up a picture a while ago. And man, this is one of these full circle moments. I'm standing there and I've got Hunter beside me. And he's probably about this tall in his baseball attire. He's a little bitty boy. And I've got my arm around him. And here I am and here he is. And then we took a picture yesterday. Hmm. That was lost me, by the way, when Hunter was about this tall. And then comes yesterday where he's wearing his blue suede shoes to the prom. Yeah, that's it. He's wearing them blue suede shoes to the prom. But I've got a picture, and I'm standing there, and here he is. He's a grown man now. He may not act like it, but he is. But here he is standing right there with me, and I've come full circle in this. But you can go to him, and you can ask, has Jesus changed your dad? He's going to tell you he has. And I can say that with all confidence because Jesus is in my DNA. You know, here's the thing. There's other people in here that knew me before I knew Jesus, and they can testify of the same. It's infallible proof. Jesus becomes part of your DNA when he saves you and when he touches your heart. And these things show us the Jesus that was proclaimed. Do you have that personal relationship? Have you come full circle with that where you can proclaim, where you can express, where the senses that God has given you, express Jesus. Have you come to that place? 
And so why does all this matter? Here it is. We're going to conclude right here. Why does all this matter? 1 John 1, 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. And our joy can be full if we're in Jesus. Your joy will never be full if you're outside of Jesus. You will search for it. You'll go to college. You'll look for it. You'll try to find it in a boy. You'll try to find it in a girl. You'll try to find it in your grandbabies. You'll try to find it in your children. You'll try to find it in sports. You'll try to find it in hobbies. You'll try to find it in alcohol, drugs, whatever you name. You will try to find this joy. But you're never going to have it fulfilled until you're in Jesus Christ. You're never going to find it without him. Galatians 5, and 23 gives us the fruits of the Spirit. And again, very familiar scripture. All this is really basic stuff that we all know today. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When the Spirit is in us, we are going to have joy. We're going to have love. We're going to have peace. We're going to have peace. It is literally, though... Your joy will be full in him. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you cannot be full of it. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. These things, these things, these things bring us to the place where we have a no-so salvation. I'm not saying that we don't have momentary lapses in our joy. Things are going to happen. This world's going to get a hold of us at times. Satan, the enemy, is going to fill our mind, fill our thoughts with things that we cannot overcome at times but Jesus. We all are in our own place right now. Everybody in this room is in their own place. I can be up here and you can be down here or vice versa. It's just we're all in our own place. But the thing is, when we have Jesus, we're going to come back and we're going to be refilled with that joy time and time again. But you're going to keep searching for it if you don't. He give us that joy so that we could know that we belong to him. And that foundation is going to be built over and over and over again as we work through this book. I want you to have the joy of Jesus in your life right here and right now. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, though, you can't have it. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And this theme is going to build over and over and over. So I want to ask this question. Save yourself the trouble. Is your joy full today? Is your joy full? If it's not, Jesus is the answer. And it begins with a personal relationship with him. It's surrender to him as Lord and Savior. I want to ask this last question. Do you know that you have eternal life? These things, 1 John 5, 13, these things were written so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the thing that we're going to keep looking at. And you may want to run from it today. Today may not be the day that you're ready and willing to surrender to Jesus as your Lord. But you better get ready because you're going to get pounded with it week after week after week. Because that is why John wrote these things so that you can know who your Lord and Savior is. And then the benefits that come with it, the joy, <laughs> the, the, the assurance of where eternity is going to be. You don't stand on shaky ground unless you choose it. There's a solid footing that you can find in Jesus. Do you have that today? Jesus is calling. He's saying, come, just as I mentioned earlier. Will you come to him, or are you going to continue to run? Are you coded with his DNA? But let's go back to the beginning. Have you experienced the senses of spirituality? Have you seen him? Have you felt him? Have you been touched by him? If you haven't, you can be. Come meet me in just a moment. You can start coming now. If you need Jesus, I would love to share him with you right here, and you can be in surrender. If you've lost touch with those, John found it at 60 years after the time that he experienced it. I think you could come and get back and get right with him right now. Don't let anybody stop you. Father, we love you. God, we thank you so much for loving us. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you embolden your people. You embolden this church. You embolden everybody that's in this place to respond as you see fit. Father, I pray that you work in our hearts. God, I pray that you give us clear direction on what you desire. And Lord, I pray that this altar gets used today like it never has been. Lord, that we come back to seek and search for you. Lord, that we come and we celebrate who you are in our lives. Our Father, that we truly surrender you to as Lord and Savior for the very first time. Lord, we know that, you, you, we know that we're sinners. 
And there's no hope outside of the blood of Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you for the, the price that was paid for us. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection because, again, we wouldn't have new life without it. And so, Father, I pray today that you work in these lives and we can surrender to you as Lord and Savior. And then we see an amazing work. Lord, just have your way in this room. Again, help us to respond as you desire. And we thank you for everything you're doing. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, stand with me.